early church writers used to say, it's in the it's in the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. We're seeing great, amazing, miraculous multiplication happen, even in the midst of such incredible darkness and persecution. This is Dan again. We're here on the Fidelis Project podcast, and today I have live from India, Mr. Josh Howard. And Josh has been working with us in the Fidelis Project for since the beginning uh, as our academic dean and advisor and a member of our board. And so we just wanted to take the chance to get to know a little bit more about Josh and and the work there in India. And Josh, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you, Dan. It's uh, an honor to be here, man. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, well, well, I know you have a very busy schedule, and I know you have a lot of irons in the fire. Um, I, I know what it's like to be a missionary, and uh, so we, we just thank you so much. Could now I I have written down here uh, a description of of you and your ministry. Um, so I'll just read that here. It says that Josh has been living in India since two thousand and eight and has a passion to see the kingdom of God spread throughout the world. He desires to raise up disciples who make disciples, leaders who create leaders, and churches that plant churches. In order to see this happen, Josh is overseeing the church planting school at Central India Christian Mission, which prepares church planters to go to unreached areas in India and the surrounding countries. In 2015, he launched a branch of the ministry called Ignite, which has seen over 6,000 churches started in six years. He has a Master's of Arts in Missional Church Movements from Wheaton College and is the co-author of a book, Christian Extremism, A Life Worth Dying For. Besides God, God's grace through Jesus, he is most thankful for his wife, Lashi, and his two sons, Josiah and Jeremiah, and his daughter, Zara. Wow, that's a lot, Josh. Um, I want to get into a lot of those things, but could you just walk us on a journey a little bit. What has been the path God has taken you on to get to this point in 2022 where you're living there? Uh, what's the name of the, the, the city that you live in now? Damo. It's Demo. Uh, right in the middle, right in the middle part of India. Yeah. Okay. And what province is, is that the name of the province? No, it's uh, Madhya Pradesh, MP. Okay. MP. All right. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about your journey, how you, how you came to Christ and how he, he, uh, kind of launched you into this kind of exciting work? Yeah, man. So um, I grew up in a Christian home, um, I, uh, but it was a very broken home. So my, my mom and dad divorced when I was four. And so my mom and I lived with my grandparents, her, her mom and dad. Uh, my grandpa was a deacon in the church. And so uh, from the time I was a baby, you know, they take me to church every week. And, and so I was, I was born and raised in the church. Um, and so from an early age on, really began to um, love Jesus and, and uh, really began to desire to serve him. Um, you know, just a, a typical, a typical, you know, um, child, a, a typical childhood in the church. You know, you, you give your life to Jesus at a very young age. I, I think I was eight um, when I was baptized and, and I really felt like I, I wanted to follow him for the rest of my life. Um, and then at 13 is when I had the opportunity to preach my first sermon, which was, by the way, the worst sermon I've ever given in my life. Uh, 13, it huh? was, yeah, man, 13. <laughs> so it was, it was horrible. I was supposed to speak for, you know, 20 or 30 minutes. And I probably sat down after five minutes of giving everything I had to give. <laughs> was this, in, was, uh, this uh, was this a Sunday morning sermon? It was a Sunday night. At that okay. time, we did Sunday morning and Sunday night. It was a, it was still open to the whole church to come, but it was a Sunday night message. Wow! Um, and so our whole youth group was leading the worship service that night, and they had asked okay. me to be the one to give the the message. So, wow. um, yeah, again, it was it was horrendous. But um, after uh, stepping down off the stage that night. Um, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that that's what God wanted me to do the rest of my life. Like I, I told my mom that night, I, I really think I know exactly what God wants me to do uh, when I get older. Um, and so if you would have asked me from 13 onwards, you know, what, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? It was always, I'm, I'm going to be a preacher. I'm, I'm going to go to Bible college and, and preach. 
And so in my head, what that meant was, you know, I was going to get a church in America and be a pastor. Like that was pretty much the only pathway at that time. Back in those days, it was pretty much either you're going to be a senior pastor or youth minister. Those were really the only two, <laughs> the only two lines of ministry that you had. And uh, because I wanted to preach, I just, you know, becoming a pastor or a preacher was kind of the line. Um, long story short, uh, had a lot of ups and downs throughout high school. A lot of, uh, we won't get into that. That's a whole separate podcast about my, uh, about my high school life and the, and the family turmoil that we went through. Mm. Um, but um, all that to say at about 16, everything around me began, uh, really began to crash down. Um, my, my grandfather passed away. Uh, I had an aunt who was put in prison um, it, it, it was, my mom became an alcoholic. Uh, it, it was a, a crazy, just, I mean, just all this stuff all at once. Yeah. And it was during that season, I'm, I'm an only child. It was during that season where I really began to view God as father. And that's really where I began to have a real deep, um, intimate relationship with him where it, where he was really all I had anymore. Everything else was gone. And he was the only thing I had to hold on to. And so it was, it was during that season of life that, that it really became something that I became very, very serious about was, was following Jesus and, and getting as close to him as I could. Um, and then it was when I went off to college that God began to lift my eyes uh, off of America and really onto the nations. Um, it's when I began to hear about unreached people and people that had never heard the name of Jesus. And, um, and so I was at a, International Conference on Missions, ICOM, in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, when I was 20 years old, and a guy gave an altar call to come forward and give your life to missions. And uh, again, that was another moment of life where I really felt God's strong pull upon my heart. And uh, I went forward that night and and said, hey, God, I don't care if I'm in you know, a gas station for five minutes or Haiti for 50 years. I just want to serve you. I just want to do whatever you've called me to do. Um, and it was funny, Dan, what I heard that night in in, in my heart, I, I heard God's voice. Now it wasn't an audible voice. You don't need to worry about me or anything, but um, but it was a it was a very clear voice. And what I heard him say that night, after I kind of laid everything down, was Josh, I don't need you. <laughs> I think there's, I think there was some pride in my heart about me laying everything down. And, and that's really all I heard him say was, Josh, I don't need you. And I'm like, what do you mean you don't need me? You've, you've asked me to give up everything. You've asked me to go overseas. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And um, there was a lesson that he taught me that night that really has stuck with me all these years. And, and he basically said this in my heart of hearts, Josh, I don't need you, but I need you to know that I want you. And there's a difference. And so don't start acting like I need you because I don't. I'm God and I can do whatever I want. I can call a thousand more Josh Howards. I don't need you, but I want you. And, and, I, and I think for everybody listening, I think it's super important for us to know that, um, you know, God chooses us and he wants us, but we are not needed by God. Um, we need him more than anything. And it was kind of a humbling moment that night in my life where I basically said, all right, God, you're right. I know you don't need me. I need you. And I want to be used by you. And so just take me wherever you want me. And uh, the very next morning, man, I woke up, I went to a breakout session at ICOM and my, uh, met a guy named Mike Shragi, who is now the director of Good News Productions in Joplin, Missouri. And he told me about an internship that they were offering to go overseas for three months and visit eight or nine different countries. And um, and that's what took me on my journey to India for the first time, man. I, I applied for the internship. Um, I was the only person who applied another, another humbling mark. Like <laughs> I thought I was going to beat out all these, you know, all these people. And, and I was, I was the only person who applied. So if they wanted it done, it had to be me. Uh, <laughs> it probably wasn't the best choice, but I was all they had. Um, and, uh, in India was one of the places that I came on that internship and, um, that whole trip, man, I was praying, you know, uh, God, if, if one of these countries that I'm visiting is the place you want me, just make that clear to me. And when I got to India, man, I, I just had a burden on my heart for this country, unlike any other place. Um, 
there was so much pain and, and difficulty, but yet so much beauty and, and so much incredible culture. And, and, uh, it was this just melting pot of all these different worlds. And, um, and so, yeah, when I got to India, man, I really felt, I, I believe this is the place that God's calling me to be. And, uh, that's where it all started, man, on that trip. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but I met the woman who's now my wife. Uh, I'm married at the time. Her name was Lashi Lal. She's the daughter of Ajahn Indu Lal, who founded the ministry that I work with about 40 years ago, Central India Christian Mission. And uh, we got married, fell in love, and, well, fell in love and then got married, uh, fell in love, then got married. And uh, I've been here 14 years now, man. It's uh, It's been a long time. Incredible. Wow. That yeah. is, that is a, I didn't know anything about that story. Um, that's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we've been working together for a long time, but it's it's great just to hear some of the background. You know, as you were talking about, you know, your sense of what God was saying to you at that that missions conference, it reminded me of the verse out of uh, Acts seventeen, where uh, where where Paul says, uh, "The God who made the world and everything in it." Lord of heaven and earth does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. I mean, I think that's just, it's so easy. I'll just speak from my own experience as a missionary. It's easy to, you know, uh, you know, a lot of people can be motivated by guilt, right? And the, the, the fact that, you know, millions are going into Christless eternity and, you know, um, it's up to me or up up to us if only we would get our act together to save them and and it, it is uh it is that that will that will uh that, that that heavy of a yoke will 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 uh either drive you insane or or, or burden you to a degree that is is not not healthy <laughs> however you know the burden is there you know there's there's genuine um a genuine call and a genuine passion to see uh, the, the good news of Christ reach all of these people. Uh, I want to get back to just a little bit more about this, this mission that, that your father-in-law started 40 years ago. What's the story there? I, you know, it's so funny. You talk to some people and they have some ministry in India that's been going for a long time. And then you mentioned another ministry you hear about in India. And you have, have you heard about this ministry? And they're like, no, I've never heard of that ministry. <laughs> and you're like, <laughs> right. well, I mean, the, the millions of people are coming to Christ through this ministry. How, how come you never heard of each other? Can you, yeah, can you just give us a little, little background there? What's, what's the story there for uh, the, the mission there? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, my, uh, my in-laws really had a burden to see the most difficult areas of India reached with the gospel. Um, my father-in-law has been very apostolic in nature, very entrepreneurial, uh, a very strong, incredible leader. And so it started 40 years ago with just him and my mother-in-law and a, a couple of their friends that really had this burden to go plant churches and and uh, go after the hardest to, to reach areas. Um, and now, I mean, 40 years later, it's unbelievable to see what God has done. Um, they We now have over, I think we're somewhere around 850 full-time staff um, in, uh, that, that is working full-time for us. We, we've seen, you know, um, when it comes to traditional churches that have been started and planted, we've got about 4,000 that are part of our network, that are part of our organization. And then when it comes to the Ignite arm that I, that you mentioned in the, in the bio that you read, that was actually written a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, we've now seen through Ignite in just the last eight and a half years, a little over 14,000 house churches started um, just just in eight and a half years time, which is crazy. And so if you look at more of the traditional, you know, kind of brick and mortar churches that have been uh, planted and multiplied, I mean, 4,000 is crazy. And then you add on to that the house church and micro church movement that's happening of uh, 14,000. Um, that alone would be something to be amazed at um, with an organization that's been around for you know such a short amount of time. Uh, but on a reality, that's just kind of you know, scratching the surface. I mean, it's uh, we also have a children's ministry where there are you know thousands of kids that are being sponsored and supported. We have six different children's homes where there's about a thousand kids total that have been orphaned by their families that are living in children's homes and in different parts of India. 
uh, we have a, a Bible college now that we have, which which is we're partnering with Fidelis with our Bible college, right? This is where the degrees come from for Fidelis or out of our Bible college. Um, we now pre COVID, we had um, about 150 students in that college. And then during COVID, we decentralized it out to about 500 different facilitation centers across the country and went from 150 students to now we have 13,000 students in the, in the program, um, which is just crazy, unbelievable. Um, we, uh, we have a hospital that we lead here in Demo. Uh, we have a nursing college um, and a, a literature department that's print, printing a ton of books in Hindi and different languages. Hmm. Um, I mean, honestly, I'm, I know I'm missing stuff. Like there's a lot more stuff we have going, but um, it's, it's amazing to, w when you hear that it started with just my in-laws and a few people and how much that's grown mm -hmm. and really they just went, they went about this with just an open heart to say, God, whatever needs there are, um, whatever you want to accomplish, we want to help meet those needs. We want to bring the love of Jesus to every nook and cranny of this nation. Um, we're not only in India now, but, uh, five or six surrounding nations as well. Um, and so God is moving in remarkable, incredible ways, man. Um, wow. and, uh, it's been yeah. really cool to be a part of it. Yep. That, you know, you use the word unbelievable and it is kind of like, is that, is that real? Is that for sure? Like, that's incredible. Oh, yeah. Uh, like, so how did, how did, how did your father-in-law 40 years ago, was it an effort started in partnership with, with churches in the West or how was it, how did, how did they move forward, you know, with, I mean, you know, 800 plus staff. That's, I mean, that's, inc that's a, that's a, that's a corporation. That's massive. That's huge. Oh, Are yeah. you all located yeah. in one spot? Are you dispersed? How, how does that work? Yeah. So yeah, it's all over that. That's all over the country. Now the main, the main, um, uh, you know, our headquarters is here in Demo where we okay. live. That's where our hospital nursing college, wow. one of our main Bible college campuses is here. One of our main children's homes is here. Um, and so we do have our main headquarters here, but no, I mean, we've got staff all over the country. Uh, we've got five other children's homes in different parts of the country. We have three other Bible college campuses in different parts of the country and now a bunch wow. of satellite sites yeah. as well. So yeah, it's not just in one location, it's yeah. all over. But how it started, yeah, I mean, my my father-in-law went to America for uh, Bible college um, and, and really had a burden to study in America, but come okay. back to India and continue to spread the love mm. of Jesus everywhere in this country. And, uh, and so, yeah, by, by partnering with churches in the West, um, he began to, yeah. uh, plant churches and, and preach and, and spread the gospel. And that's cool. Was he, was he, was he yeah. raised a Christian or was he a Hindu? No, he was raised a Christian. Okay. Uh, so he is, uh, third, I think he's third generation Christian, oh, wow. I believe. So his grandfather was first yeah his grandfather was first generation uh then his father was raised in a christian home and then he was also raised in a christian Amazing. home so his his grandfather is the one who became a, a believer mm. first that's that's amazing and is is uh is the mission connected with a certain church network or tradition of some kind yeah we're we're from the christian church church of christ background uh and so that's kind of the uh, the main network of churches that we're a part of. Um, so, you know, in India, it's uh, uh, Christian churches, disciples of Christ, uh, that type of background. So non-denominational, you know, uh, non-denominational independent churches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is that what you were also raised in? Yeah, I was raised in a Christian church. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So I would love to hear you. You, you mentioned a traditional church versus what you called like a micro church. How would you describe or define what a micro church is? Yeah. So, uh, basically for us, um, so the, the, the house churches, um, now in India, I, I will say things are, are a little bit different in India. They'll call anything a house church that doesn't have a building. So like we've got, we have house churches that are, 20 people and we have house churches that are 150 people mm. uh it's it's not the numbers really it's, except they it's don't really have a piece of real estate dedicated to christian right. meetings right. and work okay 
Right, right, just right. Somebody's so, opening up their home. As far as like church leadership, though, how does that how does that work structurally in those micro churches? Yeah, so I mean, there's a there's usually a leader, just like you would have in a in a in a traditional church. There's somebody that's leading, but um, for the sake of multiplication and reproduction, um, this is usually they're they're usually lay led. Um, and so it's not, you know, you, it's not usually trained or ordained pastors leading these micro churches. Mm-hmm. Um, it's usually everyday people that are, um, you know, passionate about sharing the gospel, passionate about, uh, spreading the kingdom. And we've taught them how to study the word together, pray together, um, and, and how to multiply disciples. So, um, they're very, very good at making disciples who multiply and, and continuing to raise up disciples who, really rather than a in the west a lot of times we lean more towards traditionally anyway we lean more towards a knowledge based discipleship like the more knowledge you gain that's how you become a disciple and these micro churches really lean more towards an obedience based discipleship like how do they actually live out what Jesus is calling us to do what does it look like in practice and in action what is their manner of life and so it kind of goes back to the early church calling themselves the way, like they had a way of life. And so what is the way of life of these disciples? Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're not usually ordained ministers leading those uh, micro churches, whereas a traditional church would usually be led by an ordained pastor who's been to Bible college and all of those things. And usually that comes with more of a, of a, of a structured, um, you know, traditional Sunday morning type of atmosphere. Wow. So you, that, I mean, you said there was like 14,000 students right now in the program? Uh, thir- 13,000 students in the, in the, in our like Bible college program. Bible college. Yes. Yeah. That, that is, that is amazing. I, I will say when we did our, our graduation ceremony a few weeks ago, it was super neat to see. <laughs> I, it was the largest Zoom call I've ever been on. Over 400, crazy. 475 different devices, at least, you know, connected to the to the call. Each device had, you know, anywhere from five to, you know, it looked to me like 30 or 40 people in a room. Um, you know, it was thousand, maybe a couple thousand people <laughs> on a single yeah. call. Is Now, I just have to ask you, is that normal? Do you guys do that frequently or is that pretty special? No, that was special, man. Like that was our first, that was our first Zoom graduation we've ever done. We had 6,000 graduates. Now all 6,000 were not on that one call, obviously, but we had, we probably had, you're right. I mean, we probably had, I'm guessing our estimates were between two and 3,000 were on that call, something like that. I I mean, it was, it was was a lot. Uh, yeah, it, it was crazy. Uh, and maybe even more, honestly, because some of them, you're right. Some of them had like 30 people on the, on one screen. Mm-hmm. And so who knows, bro, exactly how many people were there. It was a lot though. Yeah. It was special. That's not a, that's not a normal thing. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it was our first time doing it so big as well. And you had, if I'm mistaken, did you have three or four or five different languages being translated out through that call? There, there were five uh, simultaneous translations happening. Do, what, do you know the names of those languages? What were those? Do you know? Off the yeah, top of your so head? It, it was in, uh, well, English. I'm not even counting English. So it was in English. It was in Hindi. Uh, it was in Nepali. Um, it was in uh, Telugu, uh, Tamil, uh, Marathi. Um, so, so those are the main six. And then live... There were also a couple people translating into um, uh, Pashto because we had some uh, Afghani Afghani refugee graduates that were translating into the Pashto, which is the mm-hmm. is the uh, traditional Afghani language, um, and so they were translating locally live, like they muted the muted the screen and were translating to their people, and they were also doing that in Aria and uh, Kannada as well, just live like that. So so not not counting like if you combine them all i think that was what eight eight or nine languages total <laughs> that's yeah. so awesome it was i'd nuts. say we i'd say we're extreme users of the technology i think you're you're, you're <laughs> we're pushing i mean that was incredible and whoever whoever put that together your tech team just hats off i mean i mean i know it, it didn't run as perfect as we would have loved but i mean the the amount of variables that were involved in that that whole <laughs> 
that whole little plan that was awesome it was so cool it was crazy man and and the cool thing what i didn't know man and so we we've tried to figure this out zoom now has that function where on a if you, if you have an upgraded account you can actually have simultaneous translation of five different languages happening um when people log on they just have to click what language they're a part of and that's what they hear it in um and then you have designated translators that are translating it, it was unbelievable bro it was crazy it was nuts it was so cool uh, yeah thank you guys for working so hard i know it was a headache but whoever was yeah whoever your team is maybe it was you i don't know but it was just it was no, amazing no it wasn't me man i i okay. yeah my, my team my team put it all together and and did just an amazing job well pat them on the back for us because i mean that was that was a lot of work and um kind of cool to be a part of this crazy kind of collaboration and uh could you just tell me a little bit about okay you said six thousand graduates that's insane that's a lot of graduates can you describe what I, like i know what the fidelis program is could you describe what kind of program these graduates went through and kind of the you know what kind of assignments they did and what kind of you know you know credentials or certificates that they earned through that yeah, absolutely. So basically what we did, so originally we had, like I said, pre-COVID, we had students on uh, four different campuses across the country that were like actual Bible college campus, you know, like come and be and, and, uh, and study in a classroom. When COVID hit, we, we began to pray and kind of uh, dream about, well, what's this mean for us and how can we continue to train up disciples who are going to go make disciples and leaders who are going to create leaders and churches that will plant churches and so the idea came to really try to decentralize the whole thing and raise up facilitators. So before COVID happened, we were actually already working on, uh, me and a team of guys, uh, we were working on designing a curriculum that would be mainly discussion-based and discovery-based rather than lecture-based. So we were, we were studying through the adult learning styles, like how do, how do adults actually learn? And, and as most people know that are going to be listening to this, I mean, you only remember five to 10% of what you're, what you're hearing, uh, maybe a little bit more when you're watching it and listening, but when you're discussing something and, uh, th that shoots it up to like, you know, depending on the, the data between 50 and 70% retention rate, when you're actually discussing something, hmm. if you teach it back yourself, that shoots it up to 80 or 90%. So if, hmm. if you're actually teaching it to somebody else, the retention rate is through the roof of, of what you remember. And so we decided to, to shift it from a lecture base, listen only to what does it look like for people to discuss these things uh, to go back and forth and actually to to teach them again so that they're they're actually retaining what they're what they're doing. So the whole process is really built around how do these house churches really function? Um, and and so each class is basically in the context of the way a, a house church would really uh, go about doing house church by doing discovery Bible studies, um, asking questions of one another, discussing it, teaching it back to each other, practicing it. And then they had milestones they had to hit throughout the program. Things like, you know, how many people they're going to be sharing the gospel with, uh, starting their own discovery Bible studies, um, beginning to start their own house churches. Like they had milestones they had to hit that were action items. So rather than testing them just on their knowledge alone, they were actually being tested based upon their obedience and action uh, to what they were learning. Um, and so we tried to kind of flip traditional education on its head a little bit and, and really focus uh, on, on that specifically. So, um, so they're getting uh, through this particular program. Um, it is a uh, it's, it's what they call a, a diploma in India is the first year. Um, and so it's in India, if it's anything in the Christian world, it's a theology degree, even though it, even though in America, they call those things differently, it would be mm -hmm. mostly like an arts degree in America, the way that we've run it. Mm -hmm. But in India, they only have a theology degree with anything in the Christian world. So, um, this is a diploma in theology for their first year. Um, and that basically is the equivalent of an associate's degree in America. 
um, we have another uh, another year and a half that they can go on top of this where they would receive a bachelor's degree of theology. Again, it's more like a bachelor of arts in America rather than a theology degree. And then we have a master's on top of that that they can pursue. And all of this is in their local language. None of this is in English. Uh, it's mm -hmm. all, uh, we have it translated now into 15 different local languages. Wow. Is is this, uh, do, do the learners, you said they kind of gather in a house typically for their they're learning together all, all over so it, okay. it, and they're in smaller groups so yeah it's either in homes in church buildings uh you know if for example if a pastor who's facilitating has his own church building sometimes he'll call them to the church building to do it it's usually two to three times a week depending on the facilitator and how much time they they have mm. um and and so they meet two to three times a week for a few hours each time it's not it's not like full time the way that we do it uh, in in a traditional Bible school. Mm -hmm. um, it's more of a non traditional format. So it's um, not typically non residential. You do have those Bible colleges, you know, physical location. Do uh, is it about a, a you said it's about a year long program? Is that right for most of them? For the diploma, yeah, it's yeah. a year long, and mm -hmm. then and then there's another year and a half on top of that for the uh, for the bachelor's side. Yeah. Okay just a brief sketch of outline do they is it kind of old testament new testament survey what kind of you know stuff yeah do so they they're cover? yeah so they're going through they they honestly here's the cool thing man when we when i compare their current course with our old traditional course that we did mm -hmm. they're actually in the bible way more than they ever were mm -hmm. in in our traditional course which is amazing because they're mm -hmm they're they're reading way more scripture like their assignments are really mm -hmm. studying through entire books of the bible uh beginning to discuss them uh do discovery bible studies through the whole thing and so they're really diving deep into scripture but yeah they'll go through the old and new testament we focus very specifically on the life of christ in the book of acts just for uh, to be disciples who make disciples, we want to be disciples of Jesus. So, how did Jesus live? What did he act like? What did he? What were his priorities? Uh, you know, mm -hmm. how did he live? Mm -hmm. uh, how did his disciples live these things out? Right, all those things. They go through those things. We also teach them through disciple making movements, church planting movements, the um, you know the uh, the principles of reproduction and multiplication. Uh, we teach them through house church stuff, like how to lead one, how to start one, um, all of those things. Uh, they're, they're also guided through, uh, several books of the new Testament. I mean, they do a whole survey of the Bible, but then they dive mm -hmm. deep mm -hmm. into some of the books of the new Testament as well. Um, they go through spiritual warfare, uh, uh, studies. Um, they go through, um, you know, the Christian life and character type stuff. You know, what does their life need to look like? Uh, their, their rhythms of life, stuff like that. Um, uh, so anyway, I'm, I know I'm missing a bunch of stuff, oh, that's, but, that's, but it's, that's, that's, but, really but that's, helpful. that's kind of a, a big outline of it. Yeah. That is incredible. That is really, really encouraging. And, um, I know we're kind of running out of time here, but just, just briefly, you know, what are, what are some of the, I mean, there's some really exciting things. There's some really neat things that God in his mercy is, 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 is doing in a country like India. But I mean, India has got nearly a billion people, if I'm not mistaken, over um, yeah, over a what's billion. What's the what's the percentage right now in in your in your um, understanding of of Christians in the whole country? I'm sure I could look yeah. that up, but yeah. Well, what? I mean, census numbers census mm -hmm. numbers usually show uh, somewhere between three three to five percent Christian, something like that. Okay. Um, most parts of India, like if you look at them mm -hmm. geographically, many of them are less than one percent Christian. Uh, some mm -hmm. of the main the main parts mm -hmm. of India, the the evangelical world in India that's done more underground surveys, mm -hmm. they're putting the Christian population more like up in the seven to eight mm percent, -hmm. because a lot of people once they become believers, they don't mark on the census that they're Christians. They still go by their old name whether that was, you know, Hindu, Hindu or, or, or mm -hmm. Muslim or whatever, they mm -hmm. still go by that name and that, and their name is what tracks usually their background. Um, mm -hmm. and many of them are not changing their names for fear of, of persecution. Sure. So the underground numbers would show more like a seven to 8% uh, population. Um, but there's no way to know a hundred percent exactly, but, but that's right. kind of what the, the underground numbers are showing. Praise God. 
Well, I mean, that still seems like a small number, but probably compared to what it was in the past, <laughs> it's and, and the population growth there. So, Josh, I, I find here in America, uh, a lot of people, um, especially in the Christian world, um, get get pretty gloomy <laughs> because it seems that, uh, you know, the 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 the. the um, the strength and the health of the church in the West is is flagging a bit. It seems like uh, we do a lot of doom scrolling <laughs> with, you know, and maybe our, you know, our, right, right. our uh, you know, I, I just think we're kind of obsessed and we feel a bit like the kingdom of God is losing for some reason. And so one of the things I like to do is encourage people with stories of like, hey, listen, like the kingdom of Christ is really kicking the teeth out of the kingdom of darkness. Like it's... Christ is is ruling until he puts all his enemies under his feet. <laughs> and so is is that the sense you get there? Is there a momentum? Is there a movement that just I don't know, can you can you describe the situation on the yeah. ground there? I mean it's it's overwhelming yeah. the number of people that are still in darkness, but like what what are you seeing there to encourage the saints? No, God's on the move, man. Like we the movement is getting to such a point now where it's almost seriously like we just need to stay out of God's way and not mess it up. You know, like he is, he is moving in such radical, amazing, miraculous ways. Just to give you an idea, I threw out some really big numbers earlier, but back in 2019, okay. Um, we saw a little over 300 churches started that whole year, which by the way, we were thrilled about, like we, we were jumping up and down about that number. <laughs> um, this year in 2022, in the first six months of this year, as of the recording of this, the first six months, um, we've seen 4,100 churches started mm -hmm. just in the first six months of this year. Um, and so God is moving man in radical, amazing, miraculous, unprecedented ways where, I mean, we are hearing of people coming to faith left and right. Um, we've seen just in the last six months, again, we've seen about 27,000 people come to Christ, uh, just, just in the last six months. Pretty um, cool. and so absolutely bro like the church is not losing the church is 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 gaining ground all over the world and we're hearing similar stories coming out of china coming out of africa coming out of iran um coming out of the uh, of the middle east um like god is on the move and and he will continue uh to spread the gospel he will continue to spread his love and his grace and his mercy and i'm reminded all the time man god wants this way more than we do um, and so he is always active. He's always moving. His spirit's always going. Mm. And if I'm going to encourage anyone with anything, we need to be reminded that what Jesus said 2000 years ago is still true today. The harvest is ready, but the workers are few. We need desperately, we need workers. And so we need to, we need to go after the people who are lost, who desperately need Jesus. And we will find many of them open and receptive to the gospel because they are ripe and they are ready and they just need people to come and share with them. Mm. That is an excellent uh, note to, to end on. But um, yeah, I just, it's been excellent to just spend some time with you, Josh. Um, I, I'm i encouraged and, you know, let, I, I hope if there's anything that this podcast does, it would just stir up our hearts in awe and worship of Christ remembering that yeah god doesn't need us but he invites us into this this amazing thing that god is at work doing among the nations and and he's not done yet <laughs> he's still working uh christ said all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me and so we can walk in that authority and uh yeah well i really appreciate you josh i appreciate the the work that you're doing there uh we'll be praying for you as you continue to move forward i know you've got <laughs> it's a challenging environment there. Um, what is one thing people can be praying for? I know there is still opposition. There's still darkness. There's, there's, there's a, we have a very real spiritual enemy that wants to stop this movement. Um, and we know as we, we're not wanting to paint a picture of like the church is perfect. Like it's messy. Like <laughs> it's challenging that we're dealing with sinful people that, that are, that, you know, like us <laughs> that are, that are trying to, um, be faithful to, to God's call in their life. Um, what are a couple of prayer requests people could, could pray for you guys or for India? Yeah. yeah, man. I mean, I, I regularly ask our Indian brothers and sisters, you know, what, what can we be praying about? Cause they're, I mean, 
there's regular persecution. There's still people coming against the church. There's still people trying to, to stop the work of Jesus in this nation and the surrounding nations. And their boldness and faith, man, inspires me every time I ask mm-hmm. them that question. Because honestly, every time somebody will stand up and say um, something along the lines of, please tell your friends not to pray that the persecution would stop, that, but that we would have stronger backs to endure, that we would stay bold, that we would stay courageous, mm-hmm. that we would stay faithful even in the midst of it. Because what they've seen is that, uh, you know, whether, you know, no matter what's happening, the persecution is actually purifying and actually and actually multiplying the efforts of Jesus. Um, it's it's what one of the old you know early church writers used to say. It's in the it's in the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, um, and and that's so true, man. Like we're seeing great, amazing, miraculous multiplication happen even in the midst of such incredible darkness and persecution. Mm. And so our, our Indian brothers and sisters regularly ask, just continue to pray for boldness, courage, and faithfulness in the midst of difficulty. And uh, yeah, and pray that mm. God would continue to move in, in these ways until there's no place left. Amen. Well, God bless you, Josh. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to hang out with us. I hope we get to do this again soon. Yeah, I appreciate you, Dan. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. All right. God bless. Fidelis Project exists to equip Christian leaders in a rapidly changing world. To learn more about how you or someone you know may become a student with Fidelis, visit us online at www.fidelisproject.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving us a review so that others can find us easily. You can find us also on all the major social media outlets. Just look up Fidelis Project. Thanks so much.